What is up everybody? Cyber Monday has come early. My new course is on sale for $9.99 for the next five days. Hit the link in the description and pinned comment, or you can find the course on your own and apply coupon code CYBERMONDAY19, all caps. Please check out this free preview of the Naive Deep Q Learning Network from scratch, and I hope to see you inside the course. In the previous video, we discussed the need for deep neural networks for environments with large or continuous state spaces. We learned that deep neural networks can be used to approximate just about any continuous function, including our action value function in deep Q learning. We pass inputs to the model and compute the cost associated with the action the agent took and then try to minimize that cost by varying the model parameters. We also saw how to implement a basic deep neural network in code which we can use to code up our naive deep Q learning agent. Let's move on to talk about how we can implement a deep Q network for our agent. I recommend splitting up your code into two separate classes. The first class is the deep Q network itself. Our network class will look very similar to what we had for the simple classifier in the last lecture. We need two linear layers. The hidden layer should have 128 neurons in output and actions. Use an atom optimizer with our own specified learning rate, which should be 0 0.0001. For the loss function, we want the mean squared error or NN dot capital M S E loss. Do the device selection and make sure to send the network to the device. For the feed forward, use a ReLU instead of sigmoid activation. That's all we need for the network class. Just like with our regular Q-learning example, the remainder of the functionality gets stuck in the agent class. This includes a function for choosing actions, learning, and decreasing epsilon over time. The initializer should keep track of the gamma, epsilon, and action spaces at a bare minimum. It also needs to instantiate a linear deep network to act as a Q function. The choose action function should use an epsilon greedy action selection just as in the regular Q-learning example. Just a tip, you may get some complaints about the data type of the action if you try to return a PyTorch tensor. You can access the value of a tensor by using the tensor underscore name dot item function. The decrement epsilon function is the same as the Q-learning project. For the learning function, don't forget to zero the optimizer's gradient at each iteration. The next big issue we have to tackle is the question of what to use for the loss. In regular Q-learning, we incremented Q by the learning rate multiplied by the sum of the reward and the gamma multiplied by Q of state prime action prime minus Q of state and action. Our gradient descent, or atom optimizer in this case, takes care of the learning rate, so that shouldn't explicitly appear in our cost. The rest of the right-hand side of the equation is fair game for our cost function, however. I'll leave this a bit ambiguous and of course show you what to use in my own solution. Play 10,000 games and set it up to decrease epsilon such that it goes to 0 0.01 over 2,500 games or so. Use a gamma of 0 0.99 and a learning rate of 0 0.0001. Plot the decreasing epsilon and running average of scores over the last 100 games on the same plot. Go ahead and pause the video here and come back to hit play when you're ready to see my solution. Okay, now that you've had a chance to code it on your own, let's take a look at my solution. We'll need several imports for this project. We need Jim to handle the card pull environment. We'll need NumPy to handle the list averaging for the average of the previous 100 games. We'll need all of our imports from Torch to handle the design and layout of the deep neural network. As stated in the instructions, we want to separate out the various functionality into different classes. Our first class will be the linear deep Q network, which also derives from nn.module. In case it wasn't clear in the previous video on the linear classifier, deriving our class from nn.module gives us access to the self.parameters function, which returns all of the parameters for the deep neural network for use in our optimizer. Our initializer should take the learning rate, number of actions, and input dimensions as input. We're going to have 128 hidden dimensions and n actions as output. The 
So our first fully connected layer will take star input dims as input and output 128 neurons for our fully connected layer. And of course our second fully connected layer will also be linear with 128 neurons as input and n actions as output. Now in case it's not clear, the reason we have n actions as output for our second fully connected layer is because we want to calculate our estimate for q. q is a state action value function. We're passing in the state of the environment and what we want to get out is the value of each action for that state so the dimensionality must correspond to the number of actions we have for our environment. And of course the next member variable we need is the optimizer for our deep neural network. And our loss function is going to be a mean squared error loss. And we also have to do device selection. And just as a recap, this function will query the torch device to see if the first CUDA device is available. If it is not, it will default to the CPU. This will work regardless of whether or not you have a GPU to use. Next, we want to send our entire network to the device. And of course, the next thing we have to do is program our feed forward function. And you want this to take this current state of the environment as input. So what we're going to do here is pass the state of the environment through the first fully connected layer and then activate it with the ReLU activation function. Next we want to pass that quantity that we get from the activated output of layer 1 through the second fully connected layer without activating it. And of course at the end we want to return the actions. Okay that wraps up the basic deep Q network class. Let's head on to the agent class. Okay, now that we've coded up the linear deep Q network, we are ready to start coding up our agent class. The agent will really encapsulate all of the functionality that we are really interested in. The capability to choose actions, the ability to learn from its experiences, as well as the ability to decrement the agent's epsilon over time. Now we're going to want to pass in the input dimensions from our environment, the number of actions, our initial learning rate, our gamma, our initial epsilon, our epsilon decrement factor, and the minimum epsilon we want to specify for our agent. And here I've specified some very basic default values for gamma and epsilon. So let's go ahead and save all of these parameters as member variables of our class. The next variable I want to define is the action space. It's just a list of integers in the range from zero to a number of actions. This makes action selection a little bit easier in our choose action function. The other thing we want to define is the Q value for our agent. 
This will be a linear deep queue network where we're going to pass in the relevant parameters from our constructor. And just a word on the basic idea of object-oriented programming here. The reason I've set it up this way is because a, an agent has a queue estimate. An agent is not a queue estimate, right? The queue estimate is just one parameter of our agent, and that's in addition to the functionality for choosing actions, decreasing its own epsilon, and learning over time from its experiences. Just a pretty simple point on basic OOP design. You'll see many implementations where they incorporate the deep queue network as part of the agent itself. I fundamentally disagree with this. If you did it this way, it's not wrong. I just think it's a much cleaner solution to stick the deep queue network in its own class and then use that as a member variable for the agent class. So next we want to code up our choose action function and this will take an observation of the environment as input. So the first thing we want to do is calculate the random value for our epsilon greedy action selection. If it's greater than epsilon, then we want to take our greedy action. Otherwise, we want to take a random action. Now, the first thing I want to do is make sure that our observation is a PyTorch tensor that is sent to the actual CUDA device. This ties back to the point in our video on the linear classifier where the PyTorch framework is quite particular about the data types of the tensors you pass in. Note that it is self.q.device because device is a property of the linear deep Q network which is stored in our variable self.q. I also have a dtype t.float just to be extra cautious about the type of the tensor to make sure everything matches up. The next thing we want to do is get the value of the actions for a given state and then find its max. And we find the maximum by taking the argmax of the tensor actions. And then to get the actual value out of it, we have to dereference it with the dot item function. This is another kind of nuance of the PyTorch framework. When you feed forward the state through the, in, through the Q network, you don't get back a NumPy array, you actually get back a tensor, which will not serve as appropriate input to the OpenAI gyms environment. You actually want to dereference that with the item function to get the NumPy array out of it. And as part of our epsilon greedy action selection, if the random number is less than epsilon, we want to take a random action. And that's why I decided to declare the action space as a list. It just makes uh, doing the random choice a little bit easier. And regardless of how you select it, you want to return the action. So the next function we have to think about is how we're going to decrement epsilon over time. Again, I'm going to use a linear decrement. You can use any functional dependence you want, so long as it decreases epsilon over time to some minimum value over a reasonable number of games, about a quarter of the number of games it's going to play. It's not super critical. Just the main principle is that it must go to a minimum value over time, and that minimum value has to be finite. So the next thing we have to worry about is how the agent will learn from his experiences. The learning function will take the current state, action, reward, and new state as input. And as in the case of our linear classifier example, the first thing we want to do is zero our gradients. The next thing we want to do is deal with the nuance of the PyTorch framework. 
uh, where here we have state action reward and new state are numpy arrays and we want to convert them to PyTorch CUDA tensors. So let's do that. Okay, so now we have all of our NumPy arrays as PyTorch tensors. Now we're free to do the feed forward to calculate the update equation for our Q estimate. So the first thing we want is the predicted values for the current state of the environment. However, in the update equation for Q, what we really want is the delta between the action the agent actually took and the maximum action it could have taken in that particular state. Remember, our target is the maximal possible action. That's the direction we want to move in. We want to move in the direction of the most profitable action for the given state. And the distance between where we are and that target is the value given by the action we actually took. So we want to take the action indices from this Q predicted tensor. And the next parameter we want in the calculation of our target value is the maximal action for the agent's estimate of the res value of the resulting states. And the target, the direction we want to move in is going to be the reward plus gamma times the value of the maximal action in the next state. Our loss, as stated, is going to be the difference, the delta, the distance between the action we actually took and the maximum action the agent could have taken. And we're going to, of course going to want the mean squared error of that loss. And just as we did in the linear classifier, we want to backpropagate and step our optimizer. And finally, we want to decrement epsilon. Okay, so that is the entirety of the agent class. In the next video, we're going to code up the main loop and then test our agent. All right, now that we've coded up our DeepQ network and our agent, we are ready to test everything out. Let's go ahead and code up our main loop. First thing we want to do is make our environment, and that is cartpole-v1. We want to initialize a variable number of games to keep track of the number of games you want to play. Scores as an empty list and epsilon history as an empty list. Those will be useful for constructing our learning plot. Next, we want to instantiate our agent. We'll go ahead and use our default gamma learning rate and epsilon values that we coded up in the class. The only inputs we need to provide are the observation space from our environment and the number of actions. Next, we're ready to go ahead and iterate over our number of games. At the top of every episode, we want to reset the score, done flag, and the environment to its initial state. And the first thing we want to do is choose an action according to our epsilon greedy action selection using the current state of the environment as input. Mm -hmm. 
Next, we want to get the new state reward done and debug info back from the environment after taking that action. Next, we want to increment our score by the reward and go ahead and learn from the state action reward and new state tuple. Then we want to make sure that we set the old state to the new state. So on the next step of the episode, we are choosing an action according to the newest state and the most correct state of the environment. At the end of every episode, you want to go ahead and append the score and the agent's epsilon for plotting. And every 100 games, we want to print our debug info to the terminal, as well as calculate our uh, mean scores over the past 100 games. Okay, at the end of all the games, the next thing we want to do is plot out a learning curve. I want to use a little bit more sophisticated approach than we did in the regular Q-Learning agent because this will be a function that we will use going forward in the course. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the basic layout of the function and then we'll get to coding it. The first parameter the function will take is a file name. and then has to have the .png extension. Next, it'll take a list that tells us the number of games, and that'll be indexed from one instead of zero, just so that the number of games on the x-axis kind of lines up to something we would think of as number of games. We don't really you know, think from zero, we think from one, so. It'll of course take the list of scores, epsilon history, and the file name. So let's go ahead and open up a utils.py file and code this up really quickly. All right, so I'm basically going to give you this function. It doesn't really contribute much to your learning. It's just a way of plotting the data nicely so that you can see a very clear evidence of learning with your agent. So we will need numpy, pyplot as our dependencies. So our function declaration takes a list x, scores, epsilons, and file name as input. So basically we're going to create a figure with two subplots within the same figure. One subplot will correspond to the scores the agent received, and the other subplot will correspond to the epsilons the agent had over time. It'll have a couple different axes that correspond to the relevant parameters as well as two different colors to make things a little bit more legible.
So what we're doing here is creating a NumPy array to keep track of the scores from the previous 100 games. And for games 0 through 100, it will just use the current score of the teeth, of the teeth position. Just to clear things up, we want to set the visible for the x-axis on AX2 to false to make sure we don't kind of clutter up our plot. And we want to set the y-axis ticks to the right side. And set the y-label to score and color C1. and we want that label to be on the right side. And finally, you wanna go ahead and save the figure. Okay, now that we have coded the utility function and the main loop. Let's go ahead and head to the terminal to see how it all works. But before we head to the terminal, let's go ahead and go to our other file to make sure we import this function so we don't get a stupid error after we spend all that time training our agent. So we just come up to the top of the file. And import our function. Okay, now we're ready to head to the terminal and see how it all works. All right, let's see what we get. And of course, I forgot the learning rate in the declaration of our agent back in line 81. Let's go ahead and deal with that. And that is way down in line 81, so let's go ahead and head down. And I believe I specified 1 by 10 to the minus 4, or 0 0.0001. All right, let's go back to the terminal and see how it performs. All right, once more. Okay, so that is running. That will take a little bit of time. I'm going to go ahead and speed it up. And in our next video, we're going to go ahead and check out the performance of our agent. I'll see you then. All right, now that this is done running, we can take a look at the plot. The first thing we see is that the epsilon decreases over time as we would expect, and the score kind of tends to go up over time as well in tandem. As epsilon finally settles on 0.01, .01, the score kind of bottoms out. And as time goes on, the agent's score gradually increases before finally reaching its first peak. And then something mysterious happens. After reaching a peak, it catastrophically drops off back down to a minimum and this process repeats several times over. So it would appear that our naive implementation of a deep Q network as applied to a continuous state space simply doesn't work. There are a number of reasons for this, so let's kind of head back to the lecture and reason why this might be the case. First of all, we're only learning from a single example. The agent sees many thousands of steps and this experience is effectively discarded each time. One could argue that the learning is embodied by the evolution of the weights of our neural network, but this isn't quite accurate. 
Remember, our neural network is a function approximator. It's approximating a function in an incredibly high dimensional space. Namely, the number of dimensions goes like the product of the number of neurons in each layer. So many tens of thousands of dimensions for even this simple example. Each time we start an episode, we start out in a random point in that high dimensional space. As long as we keep epsilon relatively large, we can jump around in that space quite easily. This is because the max actions will tend to favor parts of the parameter space that look familiar. As we gradually reduce epsilon, our jumps become smaller and that makes getting caught in a local minimum even more likely. This explains why our score actually drops off a cliff when epsilon goes to 0.01. .01. Yet another problem is that we're using the same network to evaluate the value of the maximum action as well as to choose that maximum action. This gets updated at every step, so we're really chasing a moving target. Speaking of that max, this has the potential to bias our agent. We're always evaluating stuff with respect to the max, so this is the very definition of bias. Now, it's possible that if you let it play enough, it would learn to do reasonably well in that environment on a regular basis. But at what cost? How many games? And how feasible would that be for environments with even more dimensions? Remember, the card pole is just a vector of four elements. This is going to be dwarfed by our Atari library, and we don't have until the heat death of the universe to let this thing fumble around trying to learn to play the game. Naturally, the solutions to these problems will be coming as we get to the literature. But first, we have to learn one more facet of deep learning, and that's a crash course in computer vision.